open your Bibles to Mark chapter 10 today. We're going to continue our series in rerouting and how God takes our journey. And uh, we have a decision to make on whether we will allow ourselves to be rerouted into the direction and the design and the destiny that God has for our life. You know God wants us to live a life that, that is ordained by him, that is led by him. It's so important that we live our lives for him. I know that if you've never given your life to Jesus, if you don't know what it means to be born again, so critical that you give your life to the Lord. I don't know how we can do it without Jesus today. The world is just crazy. Where things are going on and the way things, the ancient boundary markers have been moved and, uh, and what's happening throughout the world. And I don't know when he's coming back, but I'm just going to give my life to him and live my life for him. I think that it's going to be a while before Jesus does. So in the meantime, we've got to occupy and just take ground for what he told us to do. When he said, and he told us to make disciples of all nations. But in the meantime, we've got to live the life that God called us to live. I want you to open your Bibles to Mark 10. I'm going to read this morning from the New Living Translation uh, instead of the New Living Translation. I'm going to re read from the New King James Version today. So Mark chapter 10, verse 17, Mark chapter 10, verse 17, and I lost my place. So here we go, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Mark 10, verse 17, verse 17, here we go. Now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, teacher, I have kept all these from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him, said to him, one thing you lack, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. When Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is for those who trust. Everybody say trust. Trust, trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Amen. Then Peter began to say to him, see, we have left all and followed you. So Jesus answered and said, assuredly, or I assure you, I say to you, there is no one who has left houses or brothers or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers, sisters and mothers, children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life but many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Today I want to preach a message called the other side, the other side of the needle, the other side, I want to add that, of the needle. Today, um, I love this passage as we're talking about rerouting because when God begins to reroute your journey and takes your journey from one place to the next, it's because of something that's powerful. Number one, I would, lo I would I love to say that, and I know this, that he loves you. He loves me. He loves us. He's going through everything, and here's my stuff that I've written down, is because of his immense love for us. The way that he leads us and guides us like a shepherd lead us, our savior like a shepherd leads us. And when God begins to lead us into areas that he wants us to be in, we are all going to be faced with this opportunity to choose if we're going to go down the path we currently are on or if we're going to allow the Lord to alter and reroute our path. See, we're all on this journey. We always talk about the journey. Are oh, you on the journey? You're on the journey. We're on the journey with you. You're joining on the journey with us and the journey is absolutely important. We're all on this journey together. Uh, but when we are on this journey, you have to make sure in many ways that the flexibility of your plans, they're not so concrete that God can't come in and interrupt it in order to make it even better. Yeah. 
I, I believe that God wants to interrupt plans. God wants to come in and insert himself into the journey that you are on, just much like he was on with the men on the road to Emmaus. The two men were on the road to Emmaus, and they were talking along their journey. After Jesus had been crucified and risen from the dead, they were absolutely astonished themselves. But Jesus still is trying to alter their way of thinking. Jesus wants to take us from one place to the next. But you have to be willing to say that your journey is flexible, that he can do anything that he wants with your journey I love this passage because you've got this young man he already knows that he's doing really great in life you could look at the profile of this young guy he's he's wealthy so that means he's got prestige he's got influence um, in addition to the influence he's got a lot of things that are going for him things might be easier for him because of where he is in life and that's awesome you know what I'm talking about this is his journey this is where he is but still when he faces Jesus Jesus poses something to him that is radically radically going to affect the course of his life if he allows it if he does not he's going to remain on the same course I love this passage I love it because in some ways, a lot of us are like this rich, young ruler, so to speak. No matter what socioeconomic strata of life you might be in at this time of your life, you might be on the lower end of the totem pole, you know what I'm talking about, or you might, be, um, you, you might not be a very big fish in a huge pond at this moment, but whatever it is, in due time, if you do the right things, eventually you start earning even more. But in many ways, we could look at ourselves as the rich, young ruler. I saw myself in this phase when I was younger, 21, between the age of 21 and 25. Um, I had some decisions to make. This young man comes up to Jesus. And when he says to Jesus, have you noticed that he runs to him? It says he ran, runs to him, runs to him. Then he like running to Jesus. I'm going to run to Jesus. Jesus. Then gets down on his knees. He, he kneels and then he asks. This is someone that has honor for Jesus, loves him, respects him, and is throwing himself and asking, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? What, what must I do? Jesus goes down with six different commandments, leaves four out, and tells him, out of these six things, are you doing these things? He said, I was doing them since I was a kid. Absolutely, absolutely. And Jesus said, one thing you lack. You can, you can just see the air just come out of his balloon. You know what I'm talking about? Like, pssst. Just one thing you lack. You're doing good. You're doing good, but you're just missing one thing. One thing. And here's the one thing. This one thing is so strong. This one thing is so powerful. This one thing, in many ways, for him, is everything. It's everything. It's his main thing. I love people who have this one thing. This one thing I do, the Apostle Paul said, I forget the past and move forward to, to what lies ahead. David said, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Um, his one thing many times became everything. But for this young man, his one thing was actually his hang-up. And his hang-up was the main thing. It was not that he had money. I don't want anybody leaving this place or anybody ever thinking in this church that if you've got money, you're far from God. I'm not saying that at all. If you've got money, come on, I can tell you if, you. if you make it legally, I want to tell you where you can put it in a really good place in the kingdom of God. You know what I'm talking about? Um, because I really believe there are worthy causes, there are worthy things in the kingdom of God that can expand the kingdom of God, that you'll store up your treasure in heaven in the meantime. I believe that we're supposed to be a conduit, a reservoir, not a river. I believe that the, that the more that God can get to you is because he wants to get more through you. And in the process, you are being able to be blessed in the process. So this is not about money. This is not about a guy having money and God's hating on money. God is not hating on money. Can I tell you, it is money that the, the, that the great Billy Graham became one of the, the most amazing um, evangelists ever in the history of the world. And you know what it took? It took money. It took millions of dollars. And there were millionaires, if not a few billionaires, that were financing Billy Graham's work in order for him to open up stadiums and do what they do. Cities don't just give you stadiums. You know what I'm talking about? You need to rent them. You need to send the equipment. You need to get the equipment. You have to ship stuff. And, and, and millionaires did that. Billionaires did that behind Billy Graham's ministry. As a matter of fact, the great John Wesley said this. He says, earn all you can, give all you can, save all you can. Earn all you can, give all you can, save all you can. That's the great John Wesley, the preacher up and down America back in the day in the 1700s. Earn all you can, make all, give all you can, save all you can. You know, he didn't say spend all you can. So it's not about money. It's, about, it's not about having money. One time a friend of mine, pastor in San Diego, said to me, he goes, you know, I had this guy, I took him out to golf, 
And his son said to him, says, Dad, are we bad people? He goes, why, son? He says, because the pastor's always talking down about money, and we have some. He goes, no, son, we're not bad. We're not bad at all. I said, we have to change our mindset in many ways. We have to look at it differently. So when you look at this money thing that this man was a rich, young ruler, maybe we could, we would, Jesus never called him the rich, young ruler. We just titled it above that portion of scripture. He was a young man with possessions, a young man of means. And see, there was nothing wrong with the money, but the money had him. That's the difference. That was his one thing, and his one thing was his main thing. My question to you is, what is your one thing? What is your main thing? What would be the thing that's holding you back? What would be the thing that Jesus said, would say to you, and you would struggle with giving that up? And if you didn't, you would walk away sad, knowing that that was more important than entering into the kingdom of God with God, with Jesus. See, this was holding him back from living in the kingdom of God. This was not holding him back necessarily from going to heaven, but this was the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God involves the kingdom of heaven, but the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is now. Jesus, so, Jesus said, behold, the kingdom of God has come upon you. When he read the scroll, uh, uh, the scroll of Isaiah um, on the first time after his 40 days in the wilderness, he says, behold, the kingdom of God has arrived. The kingdom of God is something you can taste, you can see, you can touch. It is here, it is now. It is a person, it is a place, it is a thing. And what was holding him back from entering into the kingdom of God was this veil. This veil, so to speak, of how he did not want to release it. One of the best things that ever happened to my life was the crossroads of not only salvation at the age of 21, of surrendering my life to Jesus, giving him my life, and asking him to come in and be my Lord and my Savior, was when I finally made the decision at some point that he would always be my Lord, but then the biggest decision that I had to make was giving up something that was near and dear to my heart that meant so much to me. When I was 21, I got involved in becoming what I wanted to be, uh, was an entrepreneur. I never saw myself as being able to be apprenticed as an entrepreneur, but I wanted it. And during those days in Hawaii, it was growing big. And I got in it, and I was so thankful for it, because in many ways, it gave me purpose. Uh, it gave me reason as a single dad going through what I was going through at that time with, with, with being alone with Courtney. I, I couldn't go to the university, back to the university, because I had to work during the day in order to, you know, to be home at night. So working at American Airlines, but doing this on the side, but with a full-time mentality. You know what I'm talking about? All in, reading all the books, listening to everything, training myself, and going out and doing the work, and doing everything that it was. I experienced some, a, a little bit of success. Uh, I started growing a little bit more, and it became everything to me at some point. I was almost obsessed with it, to the point, not a, na not a bad obsession, but a, a, a total, total sold out, I'm going to give it all I've got, I'm, I'm, I'm buying the ranch, you know what I'm talking about? You, you know what I'm talking about? When you go 100% into something, and I was going 100% into it. I meet Lisa, praise the Lord that I met Lisa. And uh, because um, if, it, um, if I didn't meet Lisa, I don't know where she would be. I don't know who she'd be with. I don't know what her life would be like today. I shudder the thought, perish the thought. But, you know, I thank God that God brought her into my life because I only, I, you know, I joke around about that stuff. But, you know, I thank God that God brought Lisa into my life. When he brought Lisa Lum um, into my life, I went, mm-hmm, I love, never mind. So anyway, um, God brought her into my life. 25 years later, here we are. But if God didn't bring Lisa into my life, I don't know if we would be pastoring. I, we probably wouldn't. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But I went to the other side of the needle and I found out. Yeah. Then, it was, it was a time I had to make a decision. Lisa and I are married. I'm still in it, but not growing like I thought I would. It's not expanding like I expected it to be. I saw other guys growing. I'm like, them? What about me? Anyway, it was like that. You know what I'm saying? I was getting a little jealous. Then it wasn't happening like I wanted it to. I was getting frustrated, and I'm crying out to the Lord. I said, Lord, why? Why am I not growing? The day that Lisa and I got married, Pastor Ralph took his finger, put it in my chest, and said, you ought to be a pastor. I knew I was supposed to be one. And I didn't want to be one. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to be a millionaire. That's what I wanted. I want to help people with that. I want to spend some, too. I want to have some. But I'm going to give a lot, too. It wasn't happening like I wanted to. I was angst, man. I'll tell you, I was agony. I was writing down in my journal, oh, God, Lord, I want to do your will. Oh, Lord, I only want to do what you want me to do. And, 
Lord, I don't know if this is it. I think this is it. This is the desire of my heart. Psalm 37, verse 4, delight myself in the Lord. He'll give me that desires of my heart. And I was wrestling, and Lisa knew inside that he wasn't supposed to be doing this. It was done already. It was Paul. It was time to move on. He's supposed to be in the ministry full time, that kind of ministry. That's what he needs to do. Not marketplace. Marketplace is for a lot of other people, not this man. This man is supposed to be a pastor. And I'm like, and we would get into arguments. I would tell her, You're stealing my dream. Stop stealing my dream. She goes, I'm not stealing your dream. I said, You're stealing my dream. Why you? Why you? Anyway, so, <laughs> so I, was, I, was, I had to mature. I had to grow up. Lisa needed finesse. You know what I'm talking about? All she, threw, all she, all she threw was fastballs. You know what I'm talking about? 90 mile per hour fastballs, you know, Chinese fastballs. Like she would smoke them. And I said, babe, you, gotta, you need a curveball. You need a change up. You need to finesse your, your delivery to me because I'm not receiving your delivery. And maybe because I was overly sensitive anyway. And so anyway, here we go. But I knew there was something. It was time for me to move. It was time for me to move on. Until I made that move, I was wrestling the whole time. I didn't have peace but I thought I did. It's kind of like you can have the peace of Jonah or the peace of Jesus. I think I said this once before. The peace of Jonah is you can run away from God's call on your life and there can be a storm on the outside, but you still can't sleep. You can still sleep when there's a storm rocking your boat because you've got the peace of Jonah. I just call it the peace of Jonah. You can get the peace of Jesus. Jesus sleeps in the middle of a storm. And you go, what manner of man is this? Who is this guy that he can sleep in the middle of a storm? That's the peace of Jesus. And so until I let go, I was like this. I was like, oh, Lord, you know, let me use this water bottle as an example. It'd be like this. Like, okay, I'm holding on to God. says, look, I want you to give me that one thing. That's your main thing. I want you to give that to me. Give that to me. And if you give it to me, I'll take it. And if you give it to me, I'll replace it. Don't ask me how big. Don't ask me how good. Don't ask me how fast. It doesn't matter. Are you, really, are you willing to give this up to me? And so what was happening was I was holding on to this, holding on to this, and holding on to this. And all of a sudden, God says, look, all right, I- I'm going to slowly pry your fingers off of it. Because sometimes God goes, I'll pull that baby off. And sometimes he's like, go right ahead, have it all you want. Go right ahead, hang on to you. Hang on, go ahead, enjoy your life. <laughs> I still love you. I'm still going to answer some prayers. I still love you. Don't worry, don't worry. It's all good. You're saved. You're going to heaven. But you can have it your way. Or you can give it to me. And I take it. And I'll give you something you never... I'm not giving you the equal thing. I'm going to give you something that you never... He's not going to promise you anything, though, because he doesn't, right? He doesn't say, uh, it's got to be of equal or greater value. That's what I thought. I even said that. God will never take something away from you, and he'll always replace it with equal or greater value. That's what I said. I don't know if I got a scripture reference for that, but I think I was wrong back then. All I know is this. Jesus said this. It's harder for this man, the young ruler... And he said it's harder because he's rich, so he's going to have a diff- more difficult time. He's got money. He's self-made. You know what I'm talking about? He's not, maybe not God-made, but self-made, but want, saying he's God-made. And he's doing really, really good. And he may not need me like he thinks he needs me because his money can answer some of his problems. But when you don't have money, you can't have, you don't get, you don't, when you're younger and you don't have money, or wherever you are, your money ain't going to answer your problems because you don't have the money to answer your problems. So you really need God. You really have to rely on him. And but because you have means and you have possessions, much possessions, and you can answer most of your own prayers with your finances and with your possessions, you don't really need as much of Jesus as somebody else does. That's why Jesus said this. He said, it's harder for those who trust in riches. The key word is trust. Trust in riches to get, enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's like a camel going through the eye of a needle. Camel going through the eye of the needle. Can I show you a picture of an eye of a needle? A picture of an eye of a needle. There it is, right there, okay? Um, it's hard. Like, I don't know about you, but even with my own eyesight right now, I got to wear glasses, and without glasses, I got to moisten that thing. I got to put them right in. You know what I'm talking about? Like, trying to find it right there. And especially if the thing kind of goes off, you know, I got that little loose thread. I don't know, have any, has, anybody, has anybody threaded a needle lately? Yeah, okay, you know what I'm talking about? I, my, my buttons, I do it. Lisa doesn't do it. I do it myself, even though know, a button breaks. It's been a while, but anyway. And you know how that thing, you got that loose one, right? You, you moisten, you got that loose one, and you got to like kind of curl them, right? You got to curl them in, right? Just like eyelashes. You got to brush your eyelashes. You got to get your eyelashes, your new lashes. Anyway, you got to put that bugger in. So what's God going to do? How's he going to get a camel through the eye of a needle? It's not possible with God, but it's impossible. It's not possible with man. It's, it's possible with God. It's impossible with man. It's possible with God. Does he do this? Next picture. Does this is what God does? Does he shrink the camel? <laughs> no. 
So I talked to my friend, Pastor Waxer Tipton, the second best Bible teacher on the island. <laughs> talked to him on Friday. <laughs> and I say, hey, Wax, you know you and I went to, we went, to, um, to, we went to Jerusalem together. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah. I said, remember the, I, I just want, want to know, is this accurate? Remember we saw all the gates? He goes, yeah. Okay, there's gates all over the city of Jerusalem. They're wooden gates. Gates are very important in ancient cities. Gates, you can change the picture back to the original one. Uh, gates keep the enemy out at night and keep everybody that needs to remain in safe. And so if you had gates, gates were very important. Around the gates, you had min administrative centers. You, you had big blocks, right? And then there were like offices on the inside, like customs, immigration, stuff like that. And of course, an army to make sure that the enemy wasn't coming in. they check your papers if you were traveling, if you were a merchant whatever it was, but at night they closed these gates. You had the beautiful gate, you had the dung gate, believe it or not, you had the eastern gate, you had all kinds of gates in order. They were massive, they were big, but they can't open a massive big gate every, now, every, every night when somebody wants to go outside. I gotta go outside. Sorry, brother, you gotta stay inside. No, what would they do? There was a door within the gate, and the door within the gate was called the eye of the needle. And in order to get through that, you would have to crouch yourself in a position like this hole right here. I would have to go like this. I'd have to squeeze myself in in order, probably a little bit wider than this. I don't want to go in there. If there's a mouse in there, a rat, it would freak me out. But you know what I'm talking about? That that's what you would have to go through. But he said it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle in order for a rich man, he said, a one who was trusting in riches in order to get into the kingdom of God. So Ronnie, my... Tour guide for the last two out of the three tours with Waxer said this. He said, well, here's what, the, here's what they do. And there's, there's, there are biblical scholars who believe, ah, that's just word of faith. That's name it and claim it stuff. Whatever. I'm giving you two sides, okay? It's just things that make you go, hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Things that make you go, hmm. That's, the, well, that's what this is. It's in that category, okay? And so now here it is. The first one is, yeah, only God can do that. Of course, it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. We all know that. And the other one is this possible. It's possible. And here it is. The camel has got to get on all fours. The camel has to be unpacked. All of its stuff that's on its back, everything that it's carrying on that caravan in order to get through, he can't take that stuff with him. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hold him back. Like, mm, mm. It can't go through, right? It can't go through. Especially if you got, you know, got to take it off. So now what he's doing, sorry about that, but you know, the guy's taking it off. <laughs> and so they take it off and now it's like this. Camels, they don't have, knee, they, they, you know, it's like this, like backwards like this. He's not, and you know what you have to do? Somebody has to go from behind and push it. Somebody from the from front has to pull it. And if you know, camels are just as stubborn, if not more, than donkeys. So you got to push it, you got to pull it. It's possible. Especially, imagine if you got two humps, right? One hump. You got two humps. Anyway. It's like speed bumps. Boom, boom. But here, check this out. Off, 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 uh, all joking aside, you'll never know what the other side is like. The rich young ruler, this young man, would live the rest of his life with a what if. What if I'd surrendered that to Jesus? What would he have done with it? We don't know. But what would he have done with his life? Now, I made it very, very clear. This is not about money. This is about what's got you. This is about what's your identity in. This is what you put your purpose in. Is there anything at any point in your life where you came to a crossroads where God said, look, if you put that on the altar, man, I'll tell you what, you know, just put that on the altar. I'm not going to show you. Maybe every now and then God will give you a vision. Maybe there, now and then God will send a prophet to prophesy or somebody to whisper something, a word of knowledge that they receive from somebody, from the Lord, from the Holy Spirit. Maybe God will reveal it in his word and God gives you little clues now and then and, oh my gosh, he's confirming what I knew. That he, it's, that's the way that God works. He's not going to show you the end. I didn't go to bed one night and God said, leave your youth ministry. You will have an incredible church in Hawaii, multi-locations, incredible influence. I never, I never woke up to that. I was like, just say yes to 60 people in, at, 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 at Waikele Elementary School. You're going to say yes to that? And I had a youth ministry three times the size as the church at the time. And I was leaving that. But you know what? There was something on the other side of that needle that I would have never have known unless I surrendered. 
Surrendering meant I could go and look. Surrendering meant that I would pass through. Surrendering meant that there would be an opportunity that I would never see before in my lifetime. What's holding you back? You know what it was, man, for us? I remember that I wanted to be the best youth pastor in America. I want Miles McPherson, who's my friend, and I wanted, he was my model. The first time I heard Miles McPherson preach, I was a young youth pastor. I said, wow, that's some preaching right there. That guy is unreal. And I would listen to him, and I wanted to be just like that. I wanted to fly all around America like him, do youth seminars, how to have a great youth ministry. That's the stuff I wanted to do. And then I put it on. I I was holding on to it. At first, I let it go, and then I held on to it. And then Pastor Ralph sees me when I come home from the mainland from that that trip. I was doing a youth youth camp in Eugene, Oregon. I spoke seven times. And guys, they paid me. They gave me a check. A check was like awesome, awesome. And I would have done it for free. But I'm going to tell you right now, it was $700. And I was so stoked. That for seven times, they paid me $700. I was like, I looked at that check, and all of a sudden, man, just like the Lord of the Rings, Schmeagol came over me. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to be a youth pastor forever. I was like, yeah. And I'm not going to tell Pastor Ralph. I'm just going to go back because he wanted me to plant a church, and I'm going to, yeah. And I remember getting off because I was so stoked because I would do it for free anyway. I was doing it for free in Hawaii anyway. My friend Jonas, he was a youth pastor with Word of Life. Hey, come speak in my camp. I speak in his camp. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, we're on a budget, T-shirt. Oh, thanks, Al. All right, that's how youth pastors roll. We give you, we will give you the T-shirt. You know what I'm saying? The fist bump in the T-shirt. That's how we did it. We did it for free. But they paid me. I said, I'm going to be a youth pastor forever. And you know what? You know the story. If you don't get my book, The Pound for Pound Principle, on sale right now, the best price ever. But anyway... And I was holding on to it as soon as I got back home. And then the question came, and I had two weeks to make a decision. Leave what I knew or step through that curtain with no guarantees. No guarantees. And I had to let it go, and I'm glad I let it go. I'm glad I let it go. Praise God. Let me ask you a question. What's the one thing? What is the one thing? Is it a relationship that's the one thing? You got to trust God. Is it what you've wrapped up your identity in? Let it go. Trust God. We don't know what God's going to do with it. The guy that gave it back to God was Isaac. Isaac. Abraham gave Isaac. Abraham said, I'll go. I'll go to Mount Moriah. I'll sacrifice my son because you're asking me to do so. I'm going to go. It doesn't sound like you, but I'm going to go. I heard your voice, and I'm going to go. And he goes up, and then what does God do? He puts him on the altar. God says, I will provide a ram in the thicket. And he hears, and look, God, he sees a ram. What does he get? He gets his son back. He gets his son back. Sometimes God just wants to test you. Are you willing to give it? Because I could put it right back in your hands. Or are you willing to let it go and sacrifice this? And are you want to see what I would replace it with? Um, it's not going to necessarily be equal or greater value. It often will be equal or often less value. But it's not the way that you see it. It's the way that God sees it. It's the way that he sees it. You've got to be able to step in through. Never live a life that what if I did? Well, I wonder what would have happened. I wonder what it would have looked like. Because you probably have some of those regrets. And for the sake of you moving forward, you have to put them behind you. That one thing I do, I put it behind me, Paul said. But now this one thing that you can do, this one thing that you can do is say, I wonder what it would look like if I went all out. I wonder what it would look like if I had said, God, you can have it if you want it. I wonder what my life could look like. If I trusted God into the great, so to speak, the unknown behind the other side of the needle. I want to give you three things because I'm supposed to. And I'll be done real quick. Here we go. Here we go. Number one. Number one, write this down. Number one, how to live on the other side. Love God to the point of surrender. You got to love God to the point of surrender. God, I love you so much, God, that I just want to surrender all. I just want to give you all. I may, you may not take it all, but I'm going to offer it all. And God, I love you to the point of I am your willing vessel, willing to be poured out for you, willing to surrender all with persecutions, realizing that people are not going to understand and I may be hated as a result of what I'm about to do. I'm going to surrender all to the point. I love you to the point of surrendering. I want to love you to the point of surrender. Jesus said, (coughs) 
John chapter 14, verse 15 says, If you love me, obey my commandments. If you love me, obey my commandments. Luke 6, verse 46, So why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? When you don't do what I say. you got to love God to the point of surrender. Number two, you've got to surrender to His will for your life. Surrender your will to His will. Exchange His will for your will. God, I give you my life. Lord, I want your will, not my will. Nevertheless, Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Your will. His will, His way is often way better than what you've already planned for yourself. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can comprehend the things that God has for those who surrender and love Him. He wants to amaze you with the plans. I stand amazed. I stand amazed at what God is doing with all of us. I'm amazed at where God has brought me from a single dad, 21 years old, to, to this, to what God has done. I got to work hard. I t- I'm telling you, kind of, kind, of, kind of got to work hard. I got to keep myself grounded. I got to stay humble. Can't let this go to my head. Can't let it go to my head. I have enough people to remind me. I had an email. God's doing great things, Mike. All of these things. And then just stay humble. Keep your head small. I'm like, hallelujah. Thank you for that email. But you know what? Yes, he's right. Because he's done so many great things. I cannot believe it. You know what? If I was still on the other side, if I didn't go over, I don't know where this would all be. Where would I be? What would we be together? Here's number three. Number three. Number three. Obey God when you can't see it or comprehend it. Obey God when you can't see it or you can't comprehend it because God's not going to show you the whole deal. I told you. It's going to be prophecy. It's going to be word of, it's going to be a word. It's going to be a word of knowledge. It's going to be mostly you waiting on the Lord and being faithful in the process of what you're going through and trusting in God. God is not slow on His promises, I'm telling you. God will deliver. God will deliver. Obey God. I want to pray for us right now. I've got something that I want to do. Uh, Lord, Lord, I pray that you seal this message in the name of Jesus. And Father, I thank you, Lord. There's so many great things that you're doing in us and through us. Father, we love you. We bless you. We give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor in the name of Jesus. And everybody said...